Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. I'm Brandon Vaughn with the Alabama Department of Public Health. Thank you for joining us for our program today, the new ASCCP Risk-Based Consensus Management Guidelines. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses, social workers, and nurse practitioners for this program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. CE credit awarded for this program will not expire. Before we get started, I believe we have a few words from our faculty. Good morning and welcome to our program today. We are excited to bring this program to you and uh, we know that uh, this has been trying times in this year of 2020 and we certainly uh, as our live staff here want to applaud and um, your dedication to, to, the, to the care needs of our patients in these most trying times. Although we did not have a nurse practitioner conference, we have met objectives and uh, want to just briefly um, applaud your efforts in these. As you know, COVID um, caused us to develop telehealth uh, patient care visits, and you have done that very successfully. And for that, we thank you immensely. It has been an innovative approach and a model that is efficient and effective, and we want to build off of that model as we continue our blended care approach uh, for our patients. Um, during this year, our, our joint committee also approved to um, um, do away with barriers that we've had for training for our nurse practitioners for LARCs and colposcopy. So we're excited to be able to bring that training to our um, ADPH nurse practitioners through a limited approved protocol through the Joint Committee. So that's a blessing that we have this opportunity to meet these patient care needs. So yes, we've dealt with COVID, but life marches on. And in that march, we've had these new development of the ASCCP uh, new uh, abnormal PAP management guidelines. And for us, um, we have really um, sort of had a, a lifeline where we've been able to reach out to Dr. Warner Huh and he has been on speed dial with Dr. Thomas at times um, for us to work through this. As you know, we work in conjunction with UAB as far as our abnormal PAP uh, management and of our patients and our protocol goes. So we will continue through this transition and we're very thankful for that relationship with Dr. Hu. Dr. Hu is our first speaker today and I really think Dr. Hu needs no introduction. He is renowned nationally and internationally. He's a scholar in his field of GYN oncology and he has recently been named as the chair esteemed to uh, UAB uh, as the chair of the department of OBGYN. He will um, short, we will shortly merge into his presentation and we are very thankful for, for and honored that he would um, bring this to us today. After that, we'll follow with our nurse practitioner seniors who really are gonna be able to help us apply the principles that Dr. Uh, huh lays out. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Warner Huh, Professor, Vice Chair, and Division Director of Gynecologic Oncology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and Stephanie Phillips, Senior Nurse Practitioner in the Bureau of Family Health Services. Later in the program, we will hear from Dewana Tatum, Krista Hood, and Nasa Hernandez, also Senior Nurse Practitioners in the Bureau of Family Health Services. Welcome to each of you. I know we have a lot of important information to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started with your presentation. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the Alabama Department of Public Health to, for the opportunity to present uh, the 2019 ASCCP Risk-Based Management Consensus Guidelines for Abnormal Cervical Cancer Screening Tests. Uh, my name is uh, Warner Ha. I am presently the uh, Division Director of Gynecologic Oncology uh, and Vice Chair of Gynecology, as well as the Senior Medical Officer in the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. 
Uh, I think many of you know uh, my prior work and my interest in this area. And uh, I want to also thank ASCCP up front for their willingness to share uh, some of their slides so I can actually go over these uh, risk-based guidelines with this group. So as a matter of my disclosures, uh, I serve uh, as the chair for a data safer monitoring board for a company called Innovia Pharmaceuticals based outside of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. They make a uh, therapeutic vaccine for pre, uh, pre-invasive disease of the cervix and also serve as a consultant for Altum as well as Dysist. Altum makes also a therapeutic product for CIN2 and 3 and Dysist makes an adjunct for colposcopy. So the three primary objectives for this talk, and uh, what I, one is I really want this group to understand how um, HPV epidemiology, much of which we have really gained over the last 10 to 15 years, drives risk-based cancer prevention. Uh, secondly, understand why risk-based management represents a substantial improvement in the care of patients. And so we're drifting away from risk-based to risk-based from algorithms that you, I think you guys are very familiar with. And then three, learn about the fundamentals of risk-based guidelines for managing patients. So quickly, how were these updated guidelines for management of abnormal screen tests and uh, cervical cancer precursors developed and finalized and uh, and realize that this is a process that has uh, taken place literally over the last four to five years. And we've had a discussion about how to build this out. So this has been a long time coming. You know, we had uh, 19 participating organizations participate in this process, even though it was led by the AACCP. As you can see, we have numerous medical professional societies, uh, not the least of which includes uh, the American College of OBGYN, uh, the American Society of Clinical Pathology, uh, the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, as well as many others. But we also had, for the, really the first time ever, uh, in a substantial manner, patient advocacy groups, including uh, Survivor, ASHA, the Latino Cancer Institute, as well as Team Marine. And then lastly, we also had our key federal agencies be involved in this uh, in this uh, engagement, particularly from the NCI uh, as a part of the National Institutes of Health, as well as the CDC. So this is a question that we commonly get, and, um, and, and it's both considered to be a strength and at times can be considered to be a criticism. So what data was used and how do we know that they're actually representative? And so specifically, how do we know that they're representative of the patients that we serve in the state of Alabama? So uh, Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, or KPNC, is really the primary driving data set for these guidelines. And they they were previously, and they continue to be today. This is by far the largest and longest real uh, world clinical experience related to uh, HPV-based screening in the world. At this point, over 1.5 million have been screened with co-testing from 2003 to 2017, and they've actually conducted uh, genotyping in almost uh, 20,000 women. Uh, this really provides uh, substantial risk-based ev- evidence for m- some of the most common decision points that occur in screening that you see in the app. And it also allows a really long follow-up in terms of how to use past history for more personalized management. This last key thing is really important. I'm gonna stress this now. So in general, you may, as providers, we may not realize this, but when we look at an abnormal screening test, we look at that test in isolation. We don't look at what their preceding screening history is. You may acknowledge it, but you probably don't use it in terms of your clinical decision-making. Here, we're advocating that providers if at all possible, take into consideration what their prior screening history is, because it, because it can have a great influence in terms of their subsequent and future risk of uh, developing cervical precancer and cancer. So in terms of validation um, of the uh, risk of risk-based management, again, we have over 1.5 million women uh, in the KPNC cohort, but we used other data sets, including the uh, New Mexico HPV PAP registry, this is the only state registry of its kind. Uh, it's led by Cosette Wheeler, uh, who is in New Mexico and has almost a half a million individuals, as well as uh, several uh, C- two CDC studies, as well as the uh, Becton-Dickinson Oncoclarity trial, which is their um, 
which is their registration, their HPV registration trial for the FDA for uh, genotyping and HPV testing, which included about 30,000 women. And so we validated this. And what you'll see is that 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 validation, and I won't get into the details because I don't think it's germane to this talk, actually uh, correlate quite well to the KPNC data set. So what I can tell you is that despite the criticism that, well, quote, quote unquote, KPNC doesn't represent my patient population as sense, and as such, I don't feel comfortable going off the guidelines. I can tell you right now, based on the fact that we've correlated this with other data sets from the CDC, New Mexico, and Becton Dickinson's trial, that I do think that this is largely representative of the patients that we serve uh, in the entire United States, including the state of Alabama. So which risk factors influence pre-cancer development? I think that some of this is not going to be a shock to you. But what we do know is that HPV vaccination prior to the age of 18 markedly reduces the risk of CIN3 by as much as 50%. And so the question is, is that how do we incorporate this in here? And the problem is, is that we have not included HPV vaccination as a variable in the app. And you may be wondering why, and, and this may be the most important variable. But the reality is, is that it's very hard for providers, particularly as women are entering screening age, to validate, A, that they've actually been validated, have been vaccinated, but B, whether or not they've been vaccinated with the entire series. And as a consequence, it puts an additional strain on the provider I think in due course, we will actually figure this out and actually start incorporating HPV vaccination. But right now, uh, realize that this is not a variable that's specifically contained uh, within the app for the reasons I've mentioned. So this is the first fundamental concept that is related to, uh, to the risk-based guidelines. So one is that the longer an HPV infection has been present, the much higher the risk of precancer and cancer. Okay, so time matters, the duration matters. We're not so much concerned about a woman who gets an HPV infection that goes away. What we're concerned about is a woman has a persistent HPV infection over months and years. That's what concerns us. The type matters. And you'll hear this over and over again, and you probably heard me say this in, in previous meetings, is that type 16, which we know is the most common type, is by far the worst actor. Right? And so if you have a woman who actually is persistently type 16 positive over time, there are studies from Denmark as well as the United States and other areas that demonstrate the risk of getting CIN3 can be as high as 40 to 45 percent. It's pretty substantial. And there are other patient factors that don't matter if you know about HPV, things like smoking and sexual partners. But on this page, if there's one take-home fundamental concept, it's the type as well as the time that matters. And so colposcopy is always needed if you've had two consecutive positive HPV tests. Now, this isn't in the guidelines, but just as food for thought, if you have a woman who's persistently positive for 16, let's say for a year or two, and they're potentially done with childbearing, the question is, since our risk is so high, should one potentially consider doing an excision on that patient because that risk is 40 to 45 percent? And this has been something that's been debated internally uh, within leadership um, and medical experts within ASCCP. But again, it goes to show you how important uh, type 16 is. We also know that the high-risk types are related and they're all causally linked to cancer. But we also do know that not all the high-risk types carry the same risk of developing cervical precancer and cancer. But again, the types like 16 and 18, they're super important, and that's why we have carved them out separately in terms of genotyping for HPV. So again, this goes back to my point earlier, and I think there's been some a fair amount of misunderstanding about HPV infections and how we counsel women. You know, when we really started linking HPV infection and cervical precancer and cancer, back in particularly the late 90s and 2000s, I think that we scared, inadvertently scared a lot of providers and women in terms of the clinical relevance of HPV infections. What we know, and this is a, 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 from a, a, a graph that's taken from Dr. Rodriguez's paper in the JNCI back in 2008, is that the vast majority of HPV infections, these are incident infections, become undetectable in about one to three years. And those that persist go on to cause CIN3 over time. 
So again, realize that the vast majority, as you can see it in the green, actually clear. Okay, and again, it's the persistent HPV infection, which is the bona fide risk factor for developing cervical precancer cancer. It's not that one-time infection that a woman gets, particularly when they're young, that goes away that puts that woman at substantial risk. So we also know that cervical precancer and cancer increases markedly when infections persist uh, for five years or more. This is from the Lancet Oncology article by Dr. McCready. This is from uh, it's sort of what's known as the unfortunate experiment that was uh, the experience that was conducted in New Zealand by a gynecologist who was basically who followed patients over time instead of treating patients who had CIN3. This is a paper for this group. If you're interested in understanding the natural history of this and, um, and the unfortunate experiment, you should definitely go to this paper. It's a really a must paper have for people who are interested in this area. But again, what we know is that if you have basically infections for five years or more, the risk of getting precancer cancer becomes substantial. This is why HPV infection is such an important marker, particularly as you look at their prior history. So what's the goals of screening, colposcopy, and treatment? And so I wanna get back to the basics here because I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves what are we trying to achieve? So what we know is that screening and by definition, screening is conducted in asymptomatic women, distinguishes normal from abnormal, right? And so if you have an abnormal screening test, then you go, then you refer to colposcopy. And then you do colposcopy with biopsies, which would then detect CIN3 or cancer. And then by treating CIN3, you in turn basically break that cycle in terms of developing cancer. Thus, in, in finality, that the goal of screening is to detect CIN3 and to also prevent cervical cancer, okay? So again, if the goal screening is not to identify a cervical cancer, the goal is to identify a cervical cancer precursor that can easily be treated. That's what we're trying to accomplish with screening and these treatment guidelines. So you guys may have seen me present this slide previously. I think I've literally presented this chart, which is a, a, a graph from Joachim Dillner's paper from the BMJ back in 2008. Uh, Joachim Dillner is an epidemiologist out in Sweden that clearly demonstrates that HIV-based screening is better than cytology alone. Okay, so very briefly, uh, the, all these women on entry are negative with their screening test. The blue or purple line represents women with a negative PAP. The red dotted line represents women who have initially a negative HPV. And the green dotted line represents those women who have negative co-testing and negative PAP and HPV. And they're followed over a six-year period. So not surprisingly, um, probably at this point, when you see the blue line, it's a straight linear rise in terms of the incidence of CIN3 per 10,000 women, right? We know that cytology that basically will miss disease, and that's been well validated over and over again. But when you, what is interesting to us at this time was how close the red curve and green curves are together. But obviously, both of them are very different than the blue curve, right? Thus, we this was the really one of the first major studies that demonstrated the value of HPV-based screening. But interestingly, the red curve and green curve are so close together that we started arguing well, how much does cytology really add if you already have a negative HPV result and in turn led to the debate of primary HPV screening? Now, for this group, and I think you're well aware of this, in the last couple of years, the United States Preventative Services Task Force has advocated for primary HPV screening. And the American Cancer Society, as of this year, also has advocated for primary HPV screening. So this is the future. Right, screening changes, particularly in this country, occur at a glacial pace. For those that remember co-testing, it took us literally over a decade to break 50% utilization uh, in this state and in this country. But realize that primary HIV screening is very much the future. So the new guidelines, as a consequence, we prefer HIV testing for follow-up. Okay, now you can surveil patients with cytology by itself, and this is totally acceptable. If you know if you don't have access to HPV testing or code testing, which is not feasible, but recognize that in most parts of the United States, this is not the case. This was the case 10 years ago, but this is not the case in 2020. But always, that cytology will be less sensitive than HPV testing for the detection of precancer, and is therefore recommended to be conducted more often than HPV. So, 
if you're going to do cytology, it's recommended at six month intervals when HPV testing is not available. And when a cytology is recommended annually, when three year intervals are recommended for HPV or co testing. So the key piece here is if you're going to divert a cytology, which is not a preference, you need to do it more frequently than you do with HPV. Okay, so here's the second fundamental concept that I want to pass on to this group that management is based on risks and not results. Okay, so what does this mean? What this means goes, it goes back to my earlier comment is we are no longer going to base management on an algorithm. We're going to base it on the calculation of what is that individual patient's risk of getting CIN3 with, with a specific test combination. Okay. And so, um, and this goes to the concept of similar management with similar risks, right? And so that risk of whether or not uh, that risk is calculated by their current results as well as their past history, including those patients who have an unknown history. And then we would recommend that one of three things happen. Either the patient gets immediately treated, the patient gets referred to Colpo, or the patient undergoes surveillance. The reason we have done this is that we want providers to be less dependent on an algorithm. Because if you guys remember from 2007 to 2012, the sheer complexity of how those algorithms looked over time, if we can continue down that path, those algorithms in my mind actually become unusable, right? So if I say a woman has a CIN3 risk of 50%, no matter how you get there, that patient needs to be treated. So we're basically trying to normalize management, and we're actually in turn, believe it or not, trying to make it easier on our providers who are using our app and using this concept. So again, the past history actually influences the current risk. So if you have a woman, again, who has a history of CIN2 worse has been treated, you can see what their immediate risk is, is actually gonna be quite high versus on the other end of the spectrum in a woman who is co-test negative, their risk is quite low. Interestingly to this group, if what if you don't know their past history or you don't want to put it into the app? Well, again, that's how we've actually calculated that out. And actually an unknown risk, a known history actually carries a certain risk of developing CIN3 or worse as well. So I don't think that any of this is surprising to you, but we have basically tried to basically normalize this risk in a way that basically irrespective of what the test combination is, if you get to a certain risk percentage, you're going to treat a patient a very specific way. So this is what I'm talking about. So patients are stratified into, in essence, five or six different risk levels. So at the very top, if you go to, if a woman has a, an immediate risk of 60 to 100%, you can see that we prefer that that patient be treated immediately, i.e., VSC and treat, which is what we do in our colposcopy clinic at UAB. We've been doing this since 2001, since 2001 and 2002. If a patient has a risk of 25 to 60 percent, then that patient would be basically either treated in the expeditious manner or you do COPO. Then as a the risk drops, you go to COPO and then you have return at one year, three years, or five years. And again, it's based on diminishing uh, a risk percentages. So we're, I want this group to think, look at this slide, even screenshot it if you have to, to understand that this is how we're stratifying patients into these risk levels. And as a consequence, if you, let's say you have a patient who has a risk of point, you know, like 0.10%, then that patient would go to return in five years, irrespective of how you would get there. This is the fundamental basis of what we're trying to talk about. And so why we're doing this? We're doing this because we feel it's actually safer for high-risk patients. Uh, it leads to fewer unnecessary invasive procedures also in low-risk patients, and it's enduring. These, act, these clinical action thresholds, so that's the other way to describe it, these basically six categories are what we call CATS, or clinical action thresholds, allow cancer prevention to remain constant in the landscape in terms of all the additional testing options and decreasing HPV prevalence. So as you can imagine, we're creating these buckets and it allows us to use all of these additional tests and put them in these specific buckets so it's easier for you guys to understand. 
So whether you have KI-67, P-16 staining, global methylation, special colposcopy technologies, these CATs allow us to basically use this fundamental basis so that you don't have to worry about a whole new set of algorithms that subsequently becomes challenging for you guys to consider. So let's talk about the safer part. So basically, the high-risk concepts in terms of are similar to the 2012 guidelines. So basically, you know, honestly, if you have a woman who uh, meets threshold uh, for CIN2 and biopsy or CIN3, those patients should be treated with the exception of pregnancy. Okay. The one thing that we really do talk about here in a lot, and we talk, and I chaired this group with Dick Guido, uh, who's at the University of Pittsburgh, is the issue of see and treat. You know, we do this a lot at UAB mainly because we've created that culture and we have the resources, but not everyone has to do this. But again, in patients who are super high risk, and particularly in the state of Alabama where follow up is a concern, you may only have one crack at that patient. And if you know that they're high risk, you really should try to endeavor trying to get that patient treated uh, ASAP. So again, uh, high risk uh, cytology with HIV infections are at highest risk. They have greater than a 75% risk of any precancer or, or, or CIN2 plus, and a greater than a 60% risk of having CIN3 plus. So again, to this group, if you have high grade cytology in conjunction with HIV 16, and remember, remember the comment that I made about 10, 15 minutes ago, that is a bad, bad combination for a woman to have. And what you should be thinking about for that patient is that is a woman that needs to be treated uh, as soon as possible. So again, I talked about expedited treatment. Um, again, what we're talking about here, again, I don't mean to harp on this issue of seeing treat, is when you just bring the patient in, you look at their cervix to make sure they don't have a obvi obvious fungating cancer, and you just basically lead them right then and there. Now, what's interesting is that our patient advocacy groups did push back in saying, that they thought that this was somewhat of an aggressive option, particularly for women who had previously undergone LEAP. But if you really think about it, all these women eventually are gonna require excision anyway, and there is such high risk, this is the group that you really need to target. So in terms of the clinical action thresholds for expedited treatment, very briefly, again, if the risk of precancer that's calculated is less than 25, then we want you to have a colpum biopsy. If it's between 25 and 59%, it's totally acceptable for you to do immediate treatment uh, or immediate treatment, or you could treat them after colpum biopsy. But the key thing here is above 60%, we really want you to consider doing immediate treatment. But if you don't have the ability to do that, a aka you don't have the ability to do an office leap like that, or you have a super busy clinic, then basically it's totally acceptable for you to do colpo and biopsy confirmation. It's just going to be incumbent on you to get the patient back. I think that's going to be the tricky part. And again, this is not recommended for women under the age of 25, and it's certainly not recommended for pregnant women. So some additional key changes as well. We've, this, this issue of ablation via cryo or laser versus excision with leap or cone has come up over and over again. The reality is, I will tell you, is the true minority – I think it's probably less than two to three percent of the United States population is doing cryo. Almost everyone is doing excision at this point. And because of the limited comfort that many people have with cryo, plus some data to suggest perhaps that cryo has worse outcomes than excision, we prefer excision to ablation, but we haven't removed it entirely. Okay. We also strongly recommend excision, particularly for patients who have adenocarcinoma in situ. And some of our experts still lean towards doing a cold knife cone versus an excision because of margin status. So observation is still preferred to treatment for CIN uh, grade one or CIN one, but treatment still remains except for patients with repeat diagnosis of CIN one that persists for two years or more. Again, this is, uh, this is a scenario that seems to be coming up more and more now, but we really would like for you to wait to do uh, treatment for CIN1 until they have persistence for two years or greater. In terms of follow-up after treatment for CIN2 and 3, again, we're talking about continued surveillance uh, with HPV testing and co-testing at three-year intervals for at, le at, for at least uh, uh, 25 years. You initially do this HPV-based testing at six months and then annually for three years. 
and then the continuing uh, surveillance at three years beyond 25 years. This 25 years is important because there is clear evidence to indicate that these women are a persistent risk for developing clinically significant uh, CI in two or three or worse. And again, we want you to avoid doing unnecessary procedures, particularly in low-risk women. So colposcopy biopsy of the cervix is recommended based on risk, not just on test results. I'm going to say this over and over again. And then again, low-grade low rate abnormalities, particularly ELSA and ASCUS, have historically been the colposcopy referral threshold. But the question is, this, is this still a valid threshold? Okay. So again, I want to talk about when colposcopy is recommended for this 4 to 24% immediate CIN3 risk. And again, um, in terms of the colposcopy threshold, when you have patients who have an estimated immediate risk of 4.0 or greater, we want you to refer those patients to colposcopy. That is the recommendation, okay? And I promise you to this group, I'm gonna go over some examples at the end so this is not so abstract that you're fearful of using the app. I promise you that this is relatively easy, okay? And then colposcopy can be deferred for certain patients. And in those patients that are deferred, you can repeat uh, HPV testing or co-testing at one year is recommended uh, with patients with minor screening abnormality to indicate that this infection with low risk is usually uh, with a low risk of underlying CN3. So again, it's okay. We really want you to rely on HPV testing and co-testing at one year. What about this return at one year, three years, and five years? And so this is something that uh, may engender a little bit of confusion, so I want to spend a little bit of time on this. So the surveillance intervals for the 2019 management guidelines, the goal was really it was simplicity. We heard our providers loud and clear from the previous 2012 guidelines that they were way too complicated and that they were hard to use. And there was really no really compelling reason to change the screening intervals, plus providers are already familiar with one year and three year and five years follow-ups. And search tracking features are really already built around these intervals. So we were not gonna change that. I think if we changed the one, three and five years, we would have created an uproar with our providers. Okay, so these intervals, this is how we look at it. So if a patient goes back to five year in return, which is pretty long when you think about it, the CIN3 risk is equivalent to the general population that have one negative HPV or code test. Okay, that's a pretty remarkably small risk. For three years, that the CIN3 risk is between three year and five year risk threshold, and one year, the CIN3 risk are between colposcopy threshold and three year threshold. I will tell you the majority of our patients who are gonna be managed on this are gonna be at the three year and one year. You're probably not gonna have that many patients, in my opinion, that are gonna go back to a five year return. So the five year uh, uh, a clinical action threshold, as you can see, the threshold is very similar to someone who's <coughs> being screened with HPV or co-testing in the general population. And again, that risk of CIN3 at five years for HPV screening alone is 0.14, and for co-testing is 0.12. So again, you're talking about a patient that has a remarkably low risk of developing CIN3. And again, to this group, the majority of your patients are not gonna achieve this five-year uh, clinical action threshold. They might over time, but not immediately, okay? And so again, if you have a woman who has a five-year CIN3 risk of less than 0.15% based on history and, uh, and current screening tests, the recommendation is to return that woman to a five-year screening interval with an HPV-based uh, testing screening recommendation. So for a three-year action threshold, that risk should be similar to that for a negative pap test in a screening population. For, so for a pap screening, it's less than 0.55. And that three-year risk is anywhere from 0.33 to 0.45 uh, based on whether you use KPNC or CDC. So that's how we actually came up with the three-year return uh, clinical action threshold. So again, if a woman is greater than 0.5 but less than 0.55, then we recommend that you repeat testing in three years with an HPV testing uh, uh, is recommended. And again, these are examples of a three-year return Okay, so if you have an HPV negative ASCA to screening result, if you have a HPV negative LSIL um, followed by an HPV negative NILM co-test, and so on and so on. So these are examples 
of how you would get to a three-year return, and you can see what these risks are. These risks are, are pretty small, okay? But you don't go to five years. You go to three years, at least initially, okay? For the one-year clinical action threshold, again, um, this is something that basically um, is below the threshold of 4% for Colpo and basically above the three-year follow-up of 0.55, and we recommend one-year testing with an HUV testing recommendation, okay? So this is an example of what would lead to a one-year return. So if you have a woman that's being co-tested, that's nil and HPV positive, that risk is 2.1%. It's under 4% for Colpo. So that patient would come back for HPV testing, likely co-testing at one year. And then a woman who's also HPV negative, that risk is 1%. So same thing. Come back in one year with an HPV test, HPV-based surveillance test. So in terms of post colposcopy results leading to one-year return, again, you can kind of see for a woman who has a pre test result of low grade, has less than CIN2, comes back post culpo and is HPV positive in NILM, that woman's risk is 2.0%. Okay, So you can see how we're putting numbers around this. That number then translates into a specific clinical trigger and that's why you now you no longer have to worry about the algorithms. You just got to push punch in the clinical variables to figure out what their immediate CIN3 risk is. Um, very briefly, key changes to the 2015 primary HRV interim guidance, which actually I, I served as lead author for the uh, ASCCP SG and ACOG, is that all positive HPV tests, irrespective of the genotype, should have a reflex triage testing performed from the same lab specimen. So what am I what am I what am I saying? What I'm saying is that we no longer trigger this based uh on whether or not you're 16 or 18 positive and everybody gets basically a reflex triage testing performed uh in terms of reflex cytology. So that's where this is a change but just I want you to recognize that this is a uh, a key difference from the previous guidance that was published back in 2015. So again, Safer, fewer unnecessary invasive procedures, and enduring. That's the really the three principles of why we put this together. Okay, and again, uh, we recognize that CIN3 prevalence and vaccinated populations are going to decrease, and that the decreasing CIN3 pre prevalence as populations undergo multiple rounds of HPV-based screening. This provides the framework of not having to constantly change the guidelines every five to eight years for you to go, okay, I gotta relearn something different. This is like basically the, the framework for this. And that's why we invested so much time so that you guys can learn this once and then expect to use it over and over again so that basically this will become automatic in the, in the months and years to come. So again, you can use both cytology-based, molecular and visual, as well as in vivo imaging and automated technologies. And you use the same platform. So and actually, some of the companies that are creating, creating novel screening and uh, surveillance mechanisms and technologies, they understand that this is the platform that they're going to have to use to basically get it, in, to get it to be embraced by our providers as well as the ASCCP. So again, um, I've already gone through this in terms of the, the, the guidelines change uh, frequently and they're confusing. We're trying to, to really try to eradicate that. So I'm, gonna, and so I'm gonna give you an example here, guys. So I want you to, I wanna show you exactly how this is gonna work. So you got a 40 year old woman. She is first screened with HPV and temp comes back as ask is HPV positive. And this is a softball question. I think most providers know the answer to this. So what would be the suggested management for this patient? A, immediate treatment, B, refer to Culpo, return one year, three years, and five years, or F, you don't know, or you just haven't been listening, you've been tuned out, and I've, been, I've, I've bored you to tears. Well, I think most people would know that we would want to do what? Probably refer this patient to Culpo. That's what the previous guidelines recommended, and in fact, that's exactly what happens here. So the risk for this patient, her risk is 4.5%. If you put it into the app, that's above basically the immediate risk, uh, 4.0 immediate risk, so that triggers Colpo, and thus the app would tell you that you would go straight to colposcopy. Okay, so that's how this would work. So no algorithm, a number that generates that a risk number then tells you basically what to do next. 
That's the difference here. So I'm going to give you another example on the opposite end of the spectrum. This is a 40-year-old woman first screened with HPV, test H still HPV positive. She's also positive for type 16. Remember, we just talked about this. How would you suggest managing this patient? Immediate treatment, culpo, one year, three years, or five years, and that, again, you don't know. So again, this woman's risk is about 60%, right? And so we would want you to immediately treat this patient, ideally. So really, but there are really two answers to this question. You could also refer this patient to Culpo if you don't have access to immediate treatment. So it's either A or B, but A being preferred. Okay, so I hope the group understands how this works. It's different. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but I think in due course, you'll feel much better about this process than you did previously. So this is what the app looks like if you haven't downloaded it. This is actually, um, these, this was like the pre-release version. It's not changed really, but this, this kind of gives you different screenshots of what this looks like in terms of the entry in the screen and what the testing shows you. You also can, if you have access to prior screening test results, you can enter on them here. And then boom, it tells you the recommendation. Colposcopy treatment, it gives you the risk and it gives you some special special populations as well. Okay, so again, less about algorithms, more about risk-based management, which then triggers a specific clinical recommendation. Okay, so again, I want to give my thanks out, my tremendous thanks out to the ASCCP. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've served as past president as well as on the executive committee as on multiple guideline committees for the ASCCP, and it's an incredible organization that I would argue in many ways has set the standards for evidence-based practice uh, in, in this area, but for all of modern medicine. I wanna thank the consensus voting participants, uh, the KPNC team, the NCI statistical team, as well as the NCI leaders, including uh, Mark Schiffman and Nico Wensenson, uh, the steering committee members, as well as the working group participants, and lastly, obviously the patients. Um, this has been an enormous effort, one that has literally taken about four to five years to accomplish with hundreds of hours of phone calls on the night, on the weekend. It, this is a labor of love, and it's really amazing to see this get rolled out. And so that will be the conclusion of my talk. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that this group has. The uh, staff at the Alabama Department of Public Health has my email, and you are more than welcome to email me with questions that you might have. Again, um, I do want to say that the um, the app is in its first version and iteration. I'm, I know that it's not perfect. I get emails about this all the time and that we will constantly update it, but we do want your feedback. There's going to be a web-based version uh, that's going to be released that hopefully you can use with your EMR and not have to rely on your phone uh, because we do more things on the computer. And I think that many people will enjoy that as well. So anyway, it's always an honor to speak to this group. Um, I, I am, uh, I love the work that you guys do and what you do for our patients, particularly in the women and women in the state of Alabama. And uh, thank you very much. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Ha. Our next presenter will be Stephanie Phillips. Stephanie, if you would continue with your portion of the presentation. So we've just listened to Dr. Hu introduce the 2019 risk-based management guidelines and the first three guiding principles that these were developed on. So now I'm going to be talking to you about the ASCCP colposcopy standards and how these apply to the management of our patients uh, after colposcopy. The objective of, of this presentation is to learn the fundamentals of risk-based guidelines for managing patients based on the ASCCP colposcopy standards. Prior to 2017, colposcopy practice in the United States was uh, limited. The accuracy and reproducibility of the colposcopy practice was limited in the United States due to a lack of standardized terminology for documentation, a lack of standardized recommendation for how practice should take place, and quality assurance measures. These variations in practice and colposcopy led to inconsistent outcomes. So the ASCCP decided to develop colposcopy standards 
to help promote best practice and decrease patient harm in the United States. This is an area where the United States is behind several other countries like the UK, Canada, and Australia where they already have stri uh, stringent training recommendations and requirements to practice colposcopy. So we're gonna start with standard number one. The first standard provides standardized terminology um, for, documenta for documentation of colposcopy findings. This is to help simplify and clarify reporting. It also lists um, the minimum requirement or the minimum elements that should be included when you're documenting your uh, colposcopy. And it also gives a comprehensive list as well. This is the minimum, the minimum criteria for reporting a colposcopy as outlined in these standards. Is the SCJ fully visualized or not fully visualized? Visibility of the SCJ uh, should be described as fully, vis fully visible, fully visualized, or not fully visualized. Um, the terms adequate or inadequate, satisfactory and unsatisfactory should not be used and this is to avoid confusion in the completeness of the exam. Think about if your patient hears you talk and say or you tell them that their uh, procedure was inadequate or unsatisfactory, they're going to think that they didn't get a good exam and that's not what that means. Um, then you also want to document is there if there's any the absence or presence of any aceto whitening, the presence or absence of any lesions, aceto white or other. If there are no aceto white lesions or any other lesions or abnormalities on the cervix, then it should be documented as unremarkable. And then last is the colposcopic impression, and this can be benign, normal, low grade, high grade, or cancer. And a lot of EHRs are developed to include these. I know ours is, if you look at any of our notes. This is a list of the comprehensive reporting criteria. It just requires that there, it lists more detail. Is the cervix visualized or fully visualized? Um, and then here it goes into more description about the color, contours, borders, vascular changes of any lesions, the locations of the lesion. You know, we use a clock face to describe where the lesions are located. If any biopsies were obtained, if an ECC or endocervical curatage was used, and then the colposcopic impression. So we're gonna look at some pictures now, and these are actual ADPH colposcopies that we have performed, just to give you an idea of what this documentation means, to put it with a picture. So if you look at the picture on the left, this is the S, or pictures of the SCJ. On the left, the SCJ is not fully visualized. If you can see, um, if you look at the arrows, it's pointing to where the, the ice, around the ice. And then on the right is a picture where the SCJ is fully visualized. The cervix is lined, the ectocervix is lined with squamous epithelium and the endocervix is lined with columnar epithelium. And these two meet at the SCJ. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see it changes from the red columnar epithelium to the white or pink, pinkish squamous epithelium. Um, and that's the squamocolumnar junction, or SCJ. Um, over time, the columnar cells are replaced with epithelial cells, and as this change or metaplasia takes place, these cells can develop into mature metaplastic squamous cells, or they can develop into atypical dysplastic cells. So this is why it's really important to visualize the SCJ, because as this takes place, and if the cells are exposed to the HPV virus, they can develop um, into dysplasia or abnormal cells. Uh, failure of, to identify the SCJ is one of the co most common errors in colposcopy, and the importance of this visualization cannot be stressed enough. This is aceto whitening. If you look at the picture on the left, picture number one, this is faint aceto whitening. It's thin, the borders are not well defined, they just kind of blend into the uh, tissue around them. And then if you look at number two, picture number two, this is a dense aceto whitening. 
you can see it has a sharp well marked border um, it's thicker it looks like it's um, could almost be wiped off um, picture number one is low grade changes picture number two is high grade changes just to give you a visualization of what the what aceto whitening may or may not look like Standard number two provides recommendations for how colposcopy should be modified based on risk. Patients referred for colposcopy have a wide range of risk for cervical precancer. Um, the risk is estimated by the triage test or the pap smear, whatever is used, if it's primary HPV or co-test. So it's used, it's based on the primary screening or the test, the triage test, and the impression at the time of colposcopy. And this risk should be used to guide how many biopsies are taken. And this is just, uh, we're going to go over what the recommendations are for biopsies. Untargeted biopsies are not recommended for patients at the lowest end of risk. Colposcopy with targeted biopsy remains the primary method for identifying precancerous lesions. Evidence-based practice recommends biopsies of any acetal-white areas. Untargeted biopsies, if you look at the lowest risk patients, and we all know that our patients are not the lowest risk, if you look at the lowest risk patients, they're defined as cytology less than high grade, no evidence of HPV 16 or 18, and then a completely normal colposcopy. And a normal colposcopy is no aceto whitening or metaplasia, any other visible abnormalities, and the SCJ must be fully visualized. The purpose of colposcopy is to identify any high-grade disease. SIN2 or greater is the threshold for treatment in the United States. And SIN3 is the surrogate marker for the development of cervical cancer. So to ensure that high-grade disease is not missed, the colposcopy standards emphasize the need for biopsies at least two and up to four of any acetal-white epithelium that's noted. More biopsies increase the chance of finding disease, and the biopsies should always be taken at the columnar I mean, at the squamo-columnar junction. Dr. Hub mentioned a see and treat. Um, the recommendations are in these new guidelines that a patient can have an immediate excisional procedure. Um, what does this mean? This means that based on their history, their pap smear, um, what you see at the time of colposcopy, they may go ahead and leap the patient while they have them there before there's any pathology been received. And the reason for this is it decreases the risk of a patient being lost to follow up. We all know we have those patients that we've sent to colposcopy and then we lose them and they never make it back for leap. An ECC is used to collect um, a sample or tissue from the endocervical canal. This is the part of the cervix that we cannot visualize. An ECC is indicated Anytime the SCJ is not fully visualized, if a lesion is present, or in a patient where no lesion is present, but they don't fall into that group of lowest risk patients. So that would be a patient who has um, a negative PAP with positive HPV for two years in a row with no lesions on the uh, colposcopy and the SCJ is fully visualized. Standard number three outlines the, uh, how a colposcopy should be performed in routine practice. Um, the pre-colposcopy evaluation. This is a part where the nurses can be involved in the colposcopy. Since we've started doing a colposcopy at the health department, um, we use the staff in the clinics to help get the patients ready. The pre-colposcopy evaluation is the HPI. And one of the things you're looking at and you want to document is why they're having their procedure. You know, 25-year-old, Gravita 1, Para 1, LMP, 10, 30, 20, 20 presents for colposcopy due to ASCUS positive PAP and the date. Um, and then you want to include the pregnancy status. If a patient is pregnant, an ECC with a curette is an absolute contraindication. So it's important to rule out pregnancy. So we need to know, are they on a reliable method? 
or if they're not on a hormonal method, have they had no unprotected sex and then the result of the pregnancy test. If you can't rule out pregnancy, an ECC can be collected with a cytology brush. Uh, then if they're menopausal or uh, have, if they've had a hysterectomy, why is it important to know about if they're postmenopausal? We want to know have they had any postmenopausal bleeding. At the time of the colposcopy, an endometrial biopsy can be collected, and this would be indicated if a patient has had any bleeding. And then the uh, obtain informed consent. The consent should cover the colposcopy, vulvar biopsy, ECC, cervical biopsy, endometrial biopsy, and the ADPH consent covers all of this. Then you move on to the examination. You're going to do a gross examination of the external genitalia and the vagina, and then the cervix after you apply 3 to 5 percent acetic acid. Documentation should be in at least text format, and we're going to look at some uh, documentation samples here in just a minute, but it should be in at least text format. Pictures are great, and all of our colposcopy reports are uploaded into the patient's charts. I would encourage you to get to go into these charts and look at the, look at the pictures. Um, if you need to know which patients, or you can get in touch with one of us and we can tell you, we can send you some pictures. But pictures are great and it tells, to me, it tells such a better story of what you're actually seeing. Biopsy sampling, if any biopsies are collected, where they're collected, and uh, if an ECC was done should also be included in the um, report. And then post-procedure, tell the patient when to expect their results and um, you know how you're going to be getting in touch with them. You know, we'll be in touch with you in 10 to 14 days with your results. Okay. So I know you're asking, why are these important to me when I do not do colposcopy? And I'm fixing to explain that. Application of these new guidelines is based on colposcopy practice that follows these standards. From a medical legal standpoint, it's our responsibility to ensure our patients receive the best plan of care, the best management based on the, be or based on the latest evidence-based recommendations. So when we're reviewing records, from an outside provider, we've got to determine if the, if the colposcopy, if this physician is using these colposcopy standards when they're doing colposcopy. Why is it important to our patient? Colposcopy that's performed and then a management plan that comes from that that does not follow these standards can alter a management plan leading to suboptimal outcomes and it can result in over or under treatment of abnormal findings. Okay, so here's where we're gonna get to, we're gonna look at some pictures and some cases, some sample cases um, for how we use these, how you will use these going forward. So our patient is a 25 year old, Gravita 2, Para 1. Her pap was high grade, she's seeking pregnancy and she was referred for colposcopy. Here's a colposcopy note that we should receive back. 25 year old, high grade pap, SCJ fully visualized, faint aceta wide at 11 to 12, ECC and biopsies were obtained, impression is high grade, and then the instructions for when to expect the results. Here's a picture from this patient. <clears throat> picture number one is the cervix prior to acetic acid application. Picture two and three are after acetic acid was applied and you can see that the SCJ, the change between the um, squamous epithelium and the columnar epithelium is fully visualized. That's a Q-tip where you use to pull the cervix down, manipulate the cervix to be able to see all the way around. And then picture four is a green filter. I'm sorry, my throat's getting scratchy. Picture four is a green filter and you can see um, it highlights any changes between in the um, lining of the cervix and it highlights any abnormal vessels or vasculature that may be present. But go back to picture two, three, and four. If you look from 11 to 12 at that white area, 
that's not present on picture one. That's the aceto white epithelium that has um, developed after the application of acetic acid. Um, another thing, if you look at the lesion, the bottom portion of that lesion, you can see all the way around the lesion. All of this is important in the management of this patient. So here's the pathology results. The biopsy was moderate dysplasia, specified as CN2. The ECC was fragments of benign endocervical glands, no dysplasia, and the plan is for a leap. So is this an appropriate plan? Well, we've got to look at everything that we know about this patient, and it's listed in a summary to the left, 25-year-old, desires pregnancy, high-grade PAP, SCJ fully visualized, the biopsy was sent to, the ECC was benign, and the plan is for a leap. Due to the potential for adverse outcomes and increased risk of preterm labor following a leap, following a leap, these new guidelines have um, give guidance for how to manage these patients. Um, if you look at arrow number one, a patient with CN CIN2 specified on biopsy can be managed uh, conservatively with observation and that observation is either going to be um, a PAP, a co-test, or a PAP and colposcopy at 6 and 12 months. Sorry. But if you look at box number two, um, this patient, I lost my train of thought, this patient can be managed conservatively because she meets all of the criteria listed in box number one. If you look at box number two, if there's any sin two or greater um, on the ECC, if the SCJ is not fully fully visualized, or the biopsy any at any either the biopsy or the ECC specifies CN3, this patient needs to go straight to leap and could not be managed conservatively. So this patient desires pregnancy, so she falls into the box criteria for box number one. So. This was the counseling that took place with this patient and it's kind of long, so I'm not gonna read it all. But I called the patient, I gave her her results. We discussed her management options, LEAP versus observation due to her age of 25 and plans for future pregnancy. Um, I did tell her that SIN2 was a precursor to cervical cancer and LEAP was the management choice or the treatment choice to remove the cells. But I did tell her that LEAP could increase the risk of preterm labor um, we discussed conservative management with coposcopy and co-test. I stressed the importance of the need to follow up. Um, she asked, could she call me back? Two days later, um, I actually called her back and she decided to proceed with conservative management. So I, I went over with her. If you move, if you change addresses, if you change phone numbers, please let us know so that we can ensure to get you back in for this follow-up because you do have this high-grade disease. This next patient is a 30-year-old, Gravita 2, Para 2. PAP was high-grade. She's had a tubal ligation. She was referred for colposcopy. Why is a tubal ligation important? Because she does. we know that she does not desire any future pregnancies. This was the records that came back from her. Um, she presented for a colposcopy due to a high-grade PAP. The SCJ was not fully visualized. Faint aceto white was noted at 9 o'clock. Biopsies were obtained, uh, and the impression was low-grade. Here are the pictures. The picture on the left is comparing the first patient with the picture on the right is this current patient. Um, if you can tell, you know, the picture on the left, you can see the squamocolumnar junction all the way around. The picture on the right, you cannot. If you notice on the picture on the right um, at 9 o'clock, around the cervical os is an area of acetal-wide epithelium that was biopsied. This patient's pathology returned mild dysplasia, 
Sin 1 on the biopsy, the ECC was benign and the outside provider plans to co-test in one year. Is this an appropriate plan? Well, what do we know about this patient? The PAP was high grade, the biopsies were Sin 1, so there's a discrepancy there. Remember the high grade PAP, these do not match, so this is discrepant. Um, so we look at this chart here. It's a low-grade SIN1 preceded by a uh, high-grade cytology. Um, look at arrow number one. This, there, you, to observe this patient, first it wouldn't be with co-test alone. It would be co-test and colposcopy in one year. Um, but we look, this patient's SCJ was not fully visualized. So look at the gray box down where arrow three is pointing. The SCJ must be fully visualized. You must be able to see the whole lesion. Um, and there must not be any SIN2 or greater on the ECC. So this patient does not meet the criteria for box no, for number one um, because the SCJ was not fully visualized. So we look at box number two, which would be a diagnostic excisional procedure. We know she does not desire any future pregnancies because she's had a tubal. So box number two, or arrow number two, would be where would be the management plan that was appropriate for her. Um, this is ASC H PAPs with a uh, low grade following an ASC or preceded by an ASC H PAP. And the reason that I put this up here is just to show you this is considered a high grade PAP as well, just like a, a just a high grade PAP smear. Um, and the visualization of the SCJ and ECC is important if you look at the arrows. Here's our last patient, 35 year old, Gravita 3, Para 3, PAP is high grade history of a BTL referred for colposcopy. Um, SCJ is not fully visualized, dense acetyl white from nine to three, and at six, ECC and cervical biopsies were obtained. Here's the pictures. Okay, we go back to the first, pic to the first patient on the left, and then the patient on the right. You can tell the SCJ is not visualized or not fully visualized. The lesion extends into the endocervical canal um, so we can't see the whole lesion. The pathology returns SIN3 on uh, the biopsy and ECC and the outside provider provides plans to do cryotherapy. Okay, so we look at this chart. Um, I forgot to include my summary to the left. In this patient situation, the ECC and the biopsy is SIN3. Um, and the upper edge, edges of the lesion are not visualized. So cryotherapy is not appropriate and is the wrong plan for this patient. As clinicians providing care, we must be aware of what is needed or what is indicated um, when we refer these patients so we know what to expect back. Cryotherapy is ablative. It does not provide a specimen. Uh, it only buries the disease. SIN3 is a precursor to cervical cancer and it's present on the biopsy and the ECC. The SCJ is not fully visualized. So in this situation, the only option for this patient is a excisional procedure with a leap or a cone. Um, it's our responsibility to ensure our patients get the best care. So this would be where you need to have a conversation with the patient that this is, this is not appropriate and this is not what national guidelines recommend. When is cryotherapy okay? Um, first, it's not, it's not the first line of choice for treatment of high grade disease in the United States. It's usually used in low resource areas, but the SCJ needs to be fully visualized. There needs to be, um, the ECC needs to be less than SIN2, and there can't, doesn't need to be any history of SIN2 or greater in the patient's past. This is just some more um, situations where other things with the colposcopy are indicated. For AGC PAP, they need an ECC, possibly an endometrial biopsy based on age or um, their history for risk for um, endometrial neoplasia. And all of these things need to be included on the referral that we send to the outside provider. Um, adenocarcinoma in situ. A hysterectomy is the preferred treatment 
but a patient can be managed conservatively only if they desire future fertility. Um, and conservative management is a co-test and colposcopy or co-test and ECC every six months for three years and then annually for two years. So that's five years that you're gonna follow this patient. If at any point management plans are received back that do not align with these guidelines or these uh, colposcopy standards, then a consult is needed. Uh, when you do your consult, you need to include these things. Where, you know, was the SCJ fully visualized? Um, if they're postpartum or they've had a vaginal delivery, that's important because they can shed the abnormal cells during delivery. So in conclusion, responsibilities, responsibilities everywhere. Our responsibility goes much further than refer for colposcopy. As we um, incorporate these guidelines into our daily practice, we must remember that the application is based on these standards. So if the provider that you're sending your patients to is not using these standards to perform colposcopy, the guidelines are not gonna work. So um, our responsibility is there to, to make sure our patients are being managed the way that is um, indicated for them based on risk, their findings, their results, and um, what's best for them. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Our program will return after a short break. Welcome back to our program. If you would go ahead and present the second part of our presentation. Okay, so putting it all together. So I just want to start off by saying good morning to everyone. Now Chris and I are going to kick off this portion of the uh, presentation with some interactive case studies. And so we're just going to jump right into it. You ready, Krista? I sure am. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so Ms. S is a 32-year-old, Gravita 2, Para 2. Her last menstrual period was October the 25th, 2020. She has a negative medical history. She is a non-smoker and has completed the HPV series. She reports no abnormal PAP history, but there are no records for review. Her PAP results returns ask us positive. What are the current recommendations? A, refer this patient for colposcopy, or B, repeat the co-test in one year. So what do we know? We know she's 32. She has completed the HPV vaccine. She has a current abnormal PAP of ASCUS positive with an unknown or undocumented history. Now, I mentioned the HPV um, series that she has completed because like Dr. Huss said earlier, this criteria was not used to come up with the 2019 guidelines. However, this is expected to change in the future so we want to make sure we are diligent in updating our patient's records. So we know without a doubt we are going to refer this patient for colposcopy. That has not changed. But what we need to know is really how to manage our patients. We need to know what her risk of SIN3 is. The ASCCP has provided us with several mechanisms to do that. They have provided some algorithms. They have provided some tables, but most important, they have provided us um, with an app that is web-based or either through your phone that you can plug in your information and it gives you the recommendations. And as you've already heard, we won't be using the algorithms or the tables on a daily basis, probably not even on a weekly basis. We just want you to know that they are available and they provide a lot of information. So before we go to the out, we'll just look at the algorithm. So we all know how to read algorithms. This is an algorithm from the 2019 risk-based management. It provides um, the management of a patient with no prior history um, of a documented HPV. So this patient, it tells us her initial screening is, is, ASCUS, is HPV positive ASCUS. So the HPV is really the most important thing we know. So the HPV is positive, it's ASCUS. It gives us the, the percent of risk. Her risk is 4.5%, her immediate risk. Um, 
So we know anything over 4.0 is going to be referred for colposcopy. So this actually, this algorithm gives us that information. Okay, for people who like tables, this is the same information. It's in a different format. And it provides a lot of um, different results, variables that you could come up with. There's like 10 different tables and um, you wanna make sure you're using the table that's based on your patient's scenario. So this is table 1A. You can see that it's for abnormal screening results when they are no known prior HPV test. So the, it looks a little scary to start with, but once you start going through it, it, it gives you a lot of information. So our patient is actually highlighted in yellow. Um, her history is unknown or undocumented. Um, the, her current results is the HPV positive, ASCUS. Now the next three columns is just uh, information from the study. The, it includes the sample size, the percent of the screening results, and the number of CN3 observed. The rest of the table is what really interests us, and that is what is her immediate risk of CN3. According to this table, it's 4.4%. So we already saw that from the algorithm. This table also gives us her five-year risk and the current recommendations of a colposcopy and the management um, confidence score. And that just helps to reassure the clinician that they are in the, uh, doing the right thing. And just one more thing I want to point out on this slide is in red. Uh, we said that the um, threshold for colposcopy is 4.0. Now there are a couple ex of exceptions, and that is you can see Ask H and AGC. They have a less than 4.0 threshold, but you can see they're referred for colposcopy. These are special situations. Um, any high-grade PAP, any ASK-H, any AGC PAP will be referred for colposcopy, so that has not changed. So Chris is going to help us out with the um, app. Okay. Thanks, Dewana. That was a lot of good information, and I think throughout the past hour and a half, we've gone over a lot of information, a lot of where all this came from, so let's start into applying this. So when you pull up, we're going to start with the app. So if you have the app pulled up on your phone, make sure you already have it open, so let's get started. So when you first pull up the app, there's going to be a management tab. You'll see three um, titles or um, folders, one for management, publication, and then definitions. And then you'll see clinical situation, testing, and recommendation. So right now, mine says management and it has the option for clinical situation. I could, um, when I put in the information, go back and forth. Once I've got my information in, if I want to go back to the clinical situation, I just hit the little um, round blue dot. So for the age, um, as the one I already told us, um, we have a 30 to 65 year old, so we're going to get into that in just a minute. I'm just kind of going through the setup. So you have your age ranges, you have clinical situations. Um, and I think that's really important, and we're going to get into definitions of those in just a moment. So when you're opening the management tab, you have to enter the age and choose the correct clinical situation so you'll get the correct recommendation for your patient. And then um, to proceed with your scenario, you, scenario, you have to enter those inf that information or the next button will be gray and needs to be blue for um, you to go forward. I think some people have noticed that you can't progress unless that's completed. So for the first um, case study, I went back and forth with pictures of the web application and pictures of the app. I, for today's presentation, I'm mostly going to be using the app, but for the web application, it's the same thing. You choose your age, you choose your clinical situation, um, and then you make sure you've got everything. So we hope that everything was set up before um, going into this presentation because there is a little bit more set up um, just to get the web application going as far as... Um, entering your information with your um, email and just confirming that with ASCCP. So with our first case, as Dewana said, um, we have a 32 year old with an ASCUS pap test with an HPV positive on her screening exam. So what do we do next? 
we want to go ahead and under our clinical situation, we choose our, well, if we choose her age first, so she's in the 30 to 65 year range. And then she does not have any prior abnormal pap history, so she will be, um, clinical situation will be the management of routine screen results, which is your first option under clinical situation. So once you choose that, you can hit next on your, um, on your app. So also, you know, like we talked about a second ago with the clinical situations, um, the definitions are really important, so you make sure you choose the right um, scenario. I'm not gonna go over all these. These are also found in the app if you um, ever forget what the definition is. There are definitions, the tab is in your app or on the web-based um, platform. So for the management of routine screening results, um, this is when we've obtained results from a routine cervical cancer screening. She's not in pre-colposcopy pre surveillance. We don't have a biopsy. She's not post-colposcopy or post-treatment. So um, this is just a view of um, the website where you put in your information. So for this patient, she is, um, it asks HPV first, she's HPV untyped positive. Um, remember, we do not do genotyping for 16 and 18, so it's a grouping of high risk um, results. So you would choose HPV positive untyped, um, and you would choose your cytology result, which is ASCUS. And that is shown on this with the app, um, where you choose HPV positive, ask a cytology result. We do not have any previous screening results that were given. So when it asks that question, my answer is no. And then I want to make sure everything is um, filled in so that I have a blue next so I can proceed. And then the confirmation page. So what's important about this is um, you want to verify that what you entered as far as your age, um, your clinical situation, and your results are correct before you get your recommendation. So it's gonna be really important once we start entering additional information post colposcopy or post treatment to make sure you confirm that you have entered the correct information before going on. So this is just the confirmation page in the app. Um, where it says that I have um, confirming that we've done a routine screening on a 30 to 65 year old and my current results are positive HPV and ASCUS. So if that is correct, I can push next. If, I'm, if I entered the wrong information, I can just go back. So then I will get my recommendation. So recommendations can be given or um, can be given to us in different ways. There can be um, a type of follow-up given or a time for follow-up given. Um, this one has the patient's risk bar. Um, and I really like how you can see as far, Dr. Ho went over some of this with his risk bar, but I really like just the visual, the colors. And I like that you can see that the immediate risk of SIN3 is 4.4%. And I feel like throughout these um, previous presentations, we've said a lot of numbers, and it's really important to remember the 4%. And while tables, like Dewana said, if tables, if you like tables, the table 1A um, that she highlighted earlier in the presentation with slide four gives us this information. So the information from table 1A gives me the immediate risk of CN3 is 4.4%. So that would be a referral for colposcopy. So I just think that's really infer in interesting how it just all ties together with what Dewana was telling me earlier. And again, this is just the um, website view. Um, I don't have the colorful risk bar with this one, but I do have, um, I can also choose references if I would like to go and read the reference um, for this recommendation, I can choose to read publications or the definitions tab if I have any questions. Okay, Dewana, um, I think we got through that first one, okay? Do you have any questions or yeah, are you ready to go I on? I think we're going okay. good. So this is our same patient. So she was referred for a colposcopy and the results were ECC benign and biopsy CN1. You explained to her that the management plan will be a co-test in one year. Her co-test is repeated in one year at her annual exam, and this year her results returned ASCUS positive, HPV positive again. Um, she is in for counseling of her PAP results and recommendations. According to the 2019 ASCCP guidelines, what are the next steps of care? Do we refer this patient, patient back for, to colposcopy? 
or are we going to co-test in one year? Now remember previously we we always referred um, repeat or, or post coposcopy abnormal paps back to uh, coposcopy again, but now, as Dr. Huss said, the guidelines are risk-based, so we're not managing just the isolated PAP that we have right now. We have to look at her current history along with her past history to come up with our percentage of um, risk. Um, and that's going to depend on all of that information. So this patient is going to be able to get a co-test in one year. We'll look at the algorithm. We're on the actual third leg. We, we had the top portion where she had the ASCUS positive with the 4.5%. Uh, she went to colposcopy. It was less than CN2. Currently, she is at the one year post colposcopy co-test and, and the risk, you, as you can see, is 3.1 and it gives us the, the guidance for a co-test in one year. So, so the table, again, remember there's about 10 different tables. You want to make sure you're on your patient scenario. Uh, our patient is highlighted in yellow. Uh, again, the, what sent the patient to coposcopy in the beginning was a low-risk PAP, which includes ASCUS or low-grade PAPs, regardless of the HPV, or either a negative PAP and a positive HPV. The next column is the coposcopy. Coposcopy results was less than CN2. The next two columns is the actual uh, current test results. And we're interested, remember, in the immediate CN3. And her immediate CN3 is 3.1. So we said that patients are, man are sent to colposcopy for a 4.0 um, percentage. So our patient doesn't meet that guideline. So now what we have to do, if we, if we don't send her for immediate um, CN3 risk, we look at the five-year risk. So we see her five-year risk is 6.0, and the recommendation is a one-year follow-up. And so Chris is going to walk us through the app. Okay, so same patient. Now she has um, your one-year follow-up ASCUS positive status post colposcopy, which was low grade or SIN1. So you want to again start over with your um, your app. You choose the age range, 30 to 65. So for this uh, management, I want to choose the management results during post colposcopy surveillance. So we know that this patient has already been triaged. We um, could have gone through the colposcopy biopsy and plugged it in that way um, if we, before we had the results to find out she would need a one year return after that colposcopy. So we didn't walk through that part, but we're managing it um, because we've already triaged her. She's got that one year um, post colposcopy co-test. So you wanna make sure you enter your current testing you will see that her results post colposcopy were ASCUS um, positive HPV, which was untyped. And do I have, it asked me, do I have any previous results since colposcopy? This is my first testing or my first surveillance testing since her colpo colposcopy. So I do not have any additional information um, to plug in at this time. So I hit no. With her biopsy results, I have um, a biopsy that was low grade, ECC was benign, so I pick the um, greater, you know, the higher dysplasia of the two and go with low grade because it doesn't give an option to um, choose additional um, biopsy results. And then it's wanting to know the colposcopy. So once I enter that information, it wants to know her prior um, cytology prior to her colposcopy. What was the indication for the colposcopy? And in this case, it was ASCUS. It doesn't ask me about the HPV status because to get to this point, it's assumed her HPV was positive. So all these have to be completed for the app to be functional and the next button to be, um, be able to, to go forward. So then once you hit next, you will have a confirmation page. Again, like I said, it's very important just to make sure you've gotten your information correct, that you have all your history, and as it grows, you will have more and more details that you wanna verify. So you wanna verify that you put in your information correctly, you've chosen the right clinical situation, and you've entered the, um, your history. So ASCUS positive post colposcopy. 
Once that is verified, you hit next. So for this case, as Joanna has kind of already told us in her table, the recommendation um, for this example is a one-year follow-up. The reason is, as she said, um, the and I really, really like the tables, Joanna, that um, you can see that her immediate risk um, it, her five-year risk is 6.0, but her immediate risk is not high enough, does not warrant the 4.0 um, threshold to go back to colposcopy. So I just think that's really interesting when you can apply the table so you can understand where the data is coming from and you can see where you're getting these numbers. What threw me at first about this um, scenario was I've been so in tune to when you hear 4.0%, um, that's colposcopy threshold, this one uh, says your five-year risk of CN3 is 6%. So when I first saw that, I thought, well, she goes back to colposcopy. But we're talking five-year risk and not immediate risk. Her immediate risk was 3.1%. So that is less than 4%. She does not go back to colposcopy at this time. Um, Joanna, do you want to go over the stratified risk um, levels, Kim? I, yeah, I can. Thank you. Um, this slide uses the percent. Um, to make the recommendations and give us guidance of how the patient will be managed. Now remember, we're not coming up with this percentage number ourselves. We don't have to figure out what it is. This number is given to us by the ASCCP according to her risk. So we need to know initially, is this patient's immediate risk of CN3 4% or higher? Now. For example, our particular patient, as Krista said, she did not meet that criteria. Her immediate risk was 3.1. So we know our patient is not going up to um, for coposcopy. She is going to now, we have to look at what is her five-year risk. And so her five-year risk was 6.0. So then, then we have to look at the boxes attached to the five-year risk to see if we're gonna manage this patient in one year, three years, or five years. This particular patient, her five-year risk, like Krista said, was 6.0, which is a return in one year. So once you get your percentages, then you can kind of look at this box and you can see what it would take for the person to get back to a three-year or what it would take for them to go to expedited treatment. So it just, it stratifies those risks. Okay, so let's continue. This is our same patient. You follow the guidelines and repeat the second follow-up surveillance co-test in one year. So remember, in 2018, she had an ASCUS positive with a COPO-CN1. 2019, she had an ASCUS positive. That was her first surveillance co-test. Now, 2020, she has a negative cytology and HPV positive. That's her second surveillance co-test. So what is your management plan in this 32-year-old with the above history? Are we going to repeat the co-test in one year, or are we going to refer her to colposcopy? So we know a couple of things about HPV, and I think Dr. Ho went over that earlier, and he said that time matters, and we can see that we do have a persistent HPV in this situation. Also, type matters, and although we're not currently doing genotyping, now, hopefully in the future, that will be something that is coming. So this patient is going to need to be referred back to colposcopy, and Krista's going to take us through that. Okay. So we're going to go back, start over, because we are, but we are still in the management during post-colposcopy surveillance. So with the previous guidelines, this patient would have gone back for colposcopy. So with current guidelines, we are going into a second surveillance co-test. So we've gotten our one-year post-colpo co-test. It was um, not um, warranted to go back for colpo. Now we're going to do another. We've gotten the, no the next surveillance co-test, which was negative HPV positive. So I'm going to choose my age range of 30 to 65. I'm still in management of results during post-colposcopy surveillance. So I want to put in the most recent um, post-colposcopy results, which were the second test, which was negative cytology, HPV positive, untyped. And this time I do want to choose yes, that the patient has previous colposcopy results results since colposcopy. So that would be that first 12-month um, follow-up test, which was ASCUS positive. 
So that was my first test. My second is the negative HPV positive. So once I enter that, it wants me to um, enter the, so I've gotten my negative HPV positive. I've entered the previous results, ASCUS HPV positive, which, was my, which were my first colposcopy um, co-test. And then I'm gonna enter in my colposcopy um, histology report, which was SIN1. And then I want to enter the prior, the cytology prior to colposcopy, which was the ASCUS that sent her originally to colposcopy. So once I have all of that information entered, I want to push next and go on to my confirmation page. Whoops, one too many. Sorry, confirmation. So like I said, the more, the further you get into follow up and the more surveillance goes on, the more time goes on, the more information you're going to have. Um, so we're at our confirmation page. We want to make sure the information is correct. So you review your information. If everything looks right, you hit next and you'll be given your recommendation. So with this, the recommendation is for colposcopy. You do not have a risk bar. Um, Dewana has for this, for this um, but you do have the algorithm th that Dewana has already gone over with us a few times. So that figure is right there. And you can enlarge that on your phone if you can't see it easily. And it actually pulls up the article too. Um, so don't hit start over yet. Um, we're going to play around with some of the results just to see what would happen if her second um, surveillance co-test was not negative HPV positive. Okay, so we already, we've already went through the top portion of this slide with our current patient and we know that Krista said that she's going to be going to colposcopy. And the algorithm on the, on the far right bottom leg is what gives us that recommendation. So what if the results were negative, negative? As you can see, this algorithm on the, on the bottom left gives us the recommendations. If, if this patient now has a negative, negative, she can be moved to a three-year follow-up. But what if our patient is ASCUS negative or L-cell negative? So the point of looking at the other results um, just, is just to demonstrate that our patient scenarios are not all going to fall into an algorithm. We are gonna have to make sure we know how to use the app so that we can get some of um, other recommendations that's not followed in the algorithm. Okay. So what if instead of the negative HPV positive, the patient's results were negative HPV negative? So I just hit back instead of start over. And um, I got back through the confirmation page and I, wanted, I want to change um, my results um, to negative, um, current testing is negative, um, HPV negative, cytology normal. My previous results were ASCUS positive. Colposcopy was a SIN1, ASCUS was the indication. And then when I hit next again, I'm gonna review that I've changed these to negative HPV negative. And then my recommendation would change to a three-year follow-up based on that negative HPV result that we just had. And then if I'd like to go another step further, I can change it once again. If it was, I just back up and change my current testing to ASCUS HPV negative. My previous results were ASCUS positive, the first co-test um, after the colposcopy. I've got my SIN1 colpo and then my ASCUS um, cytology. That's a lot of information. <laughs> um, so you wanna review that and then hit your confirmation button. And for this result, you would have a one year follow up. So what if the algorithm doesn't give you guidance about that? What do you do if you don't have guidance for an ASCUS HPV negative? So when you have, um, the algorithm doesn't give you that guidance, since this does not meet the guidelines according to the algorithm to go to colposcopy, it doesn't meet the three-year um, follow-up guidelines. And so by using the web-based or the ASCCP guidelines or the app, you will um, be told to co-test in a year. But that information isn't actually played out on your, um, ta your table or your algorithm the way that is. <laughs> Okay, moving on now, let's go to a new patient. She's 35, Gravita 2, Para 2. Her LMP was 9, 30, 20. She has no history of abnormal PAPs. 
Her current path is unsatisfactory HPV negative. What is the next steps of care? Are we one, going to repeat the cytology only in two to four months? Two, are we going to repeat the co-test in two to four months? Or three, are we going to repeat the co-test as soon as possible? So the unsatisfactory guidelines uh, have not changed. This is one thing Dr. Thomas has always told us that when you see an unsatisfactory PAP, then that should be a red flag. It could be something as minor as an infection or it could be something as severe as an occult cancer. So we wanna make sure that unsatisfactory PAPs, we do pay a lot of attention to those. When the HPV is negative in the setting of an unsatisfactory PAP, that could be a uh, inadequate sample and the specimen wasn't you know, adequate and the HPV needs to, well, both tests need to be repeated, I'm sorry. So when you have an unsat PAP and an HPV negative, remember that could be a um, inadequate specimen for the HPV as well. So both co-tests need to be repeated in two to four months. Now, if there's any kind of infection noted on that PAP, if there's anything like trick or anything like that, you do wanna make sure that you treat that infection before you bring the patient back in two to four months to repeat the co-test. Um, and the next slide is the algorithm for the unsat PAP. And you can see um, at the top, the four boxes on the top is uh, related to the HPV result. And the top left, far left, is if there is not an HPV done. Say this patient's 24 and she doesn't need an HPV and she just has an unsat PAP, you're just gonna repeat the cytology. If our patient who is 35 needs a co-test and she has an HPV negative, in an unsat PAP, we're gonna repeat both tests. The next two um, HPV um, results are positive. They um, are some of, well, the far right is the genotype. And then um, we know that if you have a positive HPV, this is what is going to drive the recommendation for the referral or for the co-test so we already have the positive HPV, so we only want to repeat the cytology in this case. So if you have a positive HPV and an unsat PAP, you want to repeat the cytology only. Now once we start doing the genotyping and we have a positive 16 or 18, the management guidelines could be different for us. Um, but what about the app for the unsat PAP, Krista? Well, let's see if we can um, enter this scenario. So you have your age range, 35 years old, and my, I'm gonna use the management of routine screening results. And then I'm gonna choose, I know that her HPV is negative, but for cytology, I don't have an option to put unsatisfactory. Unsat None is not, not the same as unsatisfactory. So I wouldn't get a, um, a, the correct answer or recommendation if I chose none. So that would be if I was only doing um, possibly HPV testing alone, but I would not choose none in this situation. Um, so I'm unable to help you with this one, Dewana. So we would have Sorry. to repeat the co-test. Okay. And remember too, if you have two unsatisfactory PAPs together or back to back, that that would, patient would need to be referred for colposcopy. Okay, let's look at some more changes we see. Um, there's a 49-year-old Gravita 3 Para 3. She's in today for her annual exam. She is in PAP follow-up due to adenocarcinoma in situ, which resulted in a complete hysterectomy 10 years ago. All co-tests have been negative since. How will you manage this patient? Are you going to do a pelvic exam, but do not obtain a pap smear because it's been, her hysterectomy was 10 years ago? Are you going to continue co-testing every three years for at least 25 years? Are you gonna just do cytology every year for 25 years? Now the change here is the co-test every three years for at least 25 years. Currently um, on a lady without a cervix, we have been doing cytology alone. But with the new guidelines, it does tell us a co-test um, is indicated. The algorithm for uh, AIS, I think Stephanie already went over this a little bit. This patient's um, results resulted in a hysterectomy. Now you can see in the, after her hysterectomy, she has to have an annual co-test every three years before she can move to a co-test. 
she has to have a co-test annually every three years before she can move to a co-test every three years uh, for 25 years. Um, so we do have closer guidance now. Um, this is, so that's the snapshot of the long-term management of AIS. Okay, so if we wanted to um, find out that management through the app, we would choose the 49-year-old um, with follow-up after treatment because this patient has been treated for AIS, as Juan has told us. So I want to choose follow-up after treatment. Um, so follow-up after treatment, as she's been treated after she had um, her hysterectomy. Um, she has her current testing, which is negative and H, um, cytology normal, HPV negative. I have previous results. Um, of, Dewana told me that she had had um, all negative co-tests and she had her hysterectomy 10 years ago, so I'm just gonna assume we have at least two negative co-tests and I'm gonna enter both. Negative HPV cytology normal. And then her treatment, if I scroll over under treated history to AIS. So I've entered that information. Sorry, it's kind of hard to manage the app and the papers and the clicker. Um, so I've got negative um, co-test AIS treatment. And then I want to confirm that information and then hit next. And then I will get to the algorithm that, that Dewana was going over. And the, my recommendation for annual co-tests times three years, and then she'll go to every three years times 25 years. Okay, thank you for making that clear, Krista. I think I got it all situated uh, now. So let's move on to case four. There's a 37-year-old Gravita 3, Para 3, in for her annual exam. Her last co-test was five years ago, which resulted in a, a negative cytology, HPV negative. No history of abnormal PAPs. To co-test today returns with the results of LCL HPV positive. What is your plan of care for this patient? A, refer for colposcopy, or B, repeat the co-test in one year. So we know that she had a negative uh, HPV test within the past five years, and, and currently now her HPV test is positive. So this could indicate either a new infection or a reappearing infection, which carries a lower risk than a persistent infection. Um, so the new guidelines allow for some um, results to for colposcopy to be deferred with some results. So let's look at our risk. Okay, so the table is 1B and you can see our patient is outlined in yellow. So we know that her results are 2.1 for her immediate risk and 3.8 for her five-year risk. The recommendations is to repeat a co-test in one year. Now the next slide just demonstrates or uh, uh, reinforces how a negative HPV test within the past five years cuts your risk uh, of, of immediate SIN3 in half. Okay. So let's um, walk this through the app. We have a 37 year old, so I choose the correct age and I'm going to choose management of routine screening results for this case. I'm going to choose her current testing, which was HPV positive, low grade, and I do have previous results, which it's very important because this will it would change if I didn't. Um, but I have a negative HPV and a normal cytology, and then when I choose next, I confirm my information after I put in my negative um, HPV, normal Pap smear, no further results. Confirm that entry, and then I will get the recommendation that we already looked at on one of the tables that her five year um, risk would be 3.78%. That's less than the 4% um, risk indicating colposcopy referral. And again, this is just our slide that summarizes where the risk falls in the treatment guidelines. So let's take a look at another change. Case five. A 49-year-old Gravita 1, Para 1, her last period was 10-20-20 with a history of a bilateral tubal and for cancer detection today. She is currently in PAP follow-up due to an LCL one year ago and was non-compliant with the recommendations. 
Her most recent PAP returned high grade and colposcopy. Her ECC was CN3 with recommendations for LEAP. The LEAP was completed. The LEAP confirmed high grade disease, CN3 diagnosis. Margins of the resection are free of high grade dysplasia. What is the next step to follow up uh, for this patient? A, co-test in one year. B, cytology and ECC in four to six months. Or C, a co-test in six months. We know previously post LEAP, if the margins were clear, we did a co-test at 12 and 24 months. The new changes provide more intense initial surveillance for our patients than previous guidelines. So the answer is a co-test in six months. This is a graphic that I think Stephanie went over a little bit earlier with us. It tells us that our patient had a leap. The recommendations was for a six month co-test and then annually times three years. So we're doing it more frequently and a little bit longer. And then every three years for 25 years. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how we're gonna get to the algorithm that Dewana just went through. Um, the clinical situation, 49 years old, with a LEAP, I'm going to choose evaluation of a colposcopic biopsy, which is your third option. And then I'm going to input the history of her, um, her high-grade results, or SIN3. And I'm going to hit Next, confirm my, my case. This is just to get the algorithm, just so we can see where we're going with this. Confirm that she had this history. And then there is my recommendation for treatment. So that's where that algorithm came in, um, where Dewana was telling us that we needed to repeat testing in six months. So I'm going to... Okay, Dewana. so the short-term follow-up uh, post-leap was a six-month co-test, which was a negative, negative result. How will you counsel this 49-year-old with a history of a leap, CN3, with free margins on her long-term plan of care? I think we've already answered that question by looking at the, um, the graphic, the algorithm. We're going to continue co-testing annually for three, for three consecutive negative tests, and then every three years for at least 25 years. Okay, so again, choose your age range. This time we're gonna choose follow-up after treatment because now we have that six month negative, HPV negative. We're going to enter that information. Um, the negative, HPV negative. Um, I don't have results since her leap. But I've just got her treatment next, which was the SIN3. And then when I confirm the information, I make sure I've got my information correct and my recommendation will be one year follow-up after that. So then I will go to, um, she will need three co-tests after that, three co-tests annually before we will go to Q3 years um, follow-up pattern. And I have a new guest up here. We Thanks, magically sir. switched while, <laughs> while we're doing that. Okay, okay, so good morning to you all. Um, let's move on with our case number six. We have a 32-year-old. 30, she is in PAP follow-up, and she had a negative HPV positive in 2019. This year, she has an ASCUS HPV positive. So what is the management plan for this patient? Colposcopy, co-test in three years, or co-test in one year? We're gonna co-test this patient in one year, and this is one of the new changes that we have with the new guidelines. Prior to these new guidelines, if this patient that had a negative positive went to co-test in a year, if that was anything but negative negative, we would have sent this patient back to colposcopy. But remember, we've been talking about this throughout the presentation. Our new protocol is risk-based guidelines. So in this particular case, we're gonna co-test this patient in a year. So if we look at this table, we've been looking at these tables throughout the presentation as well. We have a patient with a history of a negative positive and a current ASCUS negative. And this table shows us the immediate risk and the five-year risk of this patient developing SYN3. So now, if you look at the second line that is highlighted by blue, you see the patient history, negative positive. Current history with HPV result is ASCUS negative. So her immediate risk is 0.35, which is less than the 4% needed to send her to colposcopy. 
So then we look at the five-year risk, which is 2.6%, and that is above the 0.55 threshold for a three-year return. So that's why the recommendation is to bring this patient back in one year. Okay. So, Krista, will you show us? Sure. So again, what Nasa said, 32 years old, so we choose our age, and our clinical situation will be returned visit during pre-colposcopy surveillance. So she has not gone to colposcopy. Her previous pap did not indicate um, a colposcopy, but we do have a, a previous result. So I'm going to um, choose that and enter my negative HPV and my ASCUS, which is my current testing, and my prior testing, which I choose yes, will be my um, negative cytology HPV positive. So once I enter the HPV positive normal cytology, I don't have any additional results. Confirm what I've entered and I will get my recommendation of a one year follow up or one year return for this case is what Nasa was going over with her table. Okay, so moving on, case number seven. Let's talk a little bit about immunocompromised patients. This is one of the clinical situations that you're gonna find in your app. So most of the time when we hear this term of immunocompromised status, the first thing that comes to mind is a patient that is either HIV positive or a patient that had an organ transplant. But the term really is a spectrum of diseases. And it includes, of course, the HIV positive, any, any person that had a stem cell or organ transplant, systemic lupus, or any person that has inflammatory bowel disease or, or any rheumatologic disorder that requires immunosuppressive treatment. Now, why is this important? Because this type of conditions that suppress the cell-mediated immunity have also been associated with virally induced types of cancers, such as cervical cancer. So we really need to follow up these immunosuppressed patients really closely. So let's take a look at a case. 31 years old, she's been an insulin-dependent diabetic for 15 years. She was recently diagnosed with lupus and she is on immunosuppressed treatment. She's been on Imuran for the last six months. Her pap history, five years ago, she was negative, negative. This year, she's low grade HPP negative. So what are your recommendations for this 31 year old with a history of negative pap, negative HPV, and a current low grade HPV negative? Co-test in a year, cytology in six months, colposcopy, or consult for guidance. This patient we will refer for colposcopy, and Krista is going to show us the algorithm for immunosuppressed patients. Okay, thanks, Nisa. So this is um, one of the special situations that you choose. You've got your age range of 31 years old. So when you choose the special situation for the immunosuppressed patient, you're going to get this pop-up. So that is all the information that we are given through this app um, for guidance. But we've kind of picked it apart and drawn out an algorithm to kind of help guide us. So this was something that we created as we developed this. We thought it would be helpful to actually see how you would follow that based on that pop-up that you were given in your app. So for her results, if you look across the algorithm, you have your HPV positive, ask his patient goes to colposcopy. Your ask his patient with no HPV testing gets a repeat cytology in six to 12 months. And then if that result is greater than ask us, greater than or equal to ask us, they go to colposcopy. The one that was a little bit more difficult to um, go through was that HPV negative ask us. So for this one, you would repeat age-based testing in six to 12 months. So that depends on would you do a co-test if she's greater than 30, less than 30, you may just reflex. But depending on what that result is, you would need to consult for further guidance because it doesn't go through what we would do for further um, recommendations for this case for that case of ASCUS HPV negative. But for NACE's um, situation, which was low grade, you go to colposcopy regardless of your HPV testing result. That is correct. So moving on, case number eight. Now we have a 43 year old. In May of 2019, she had an ASCUS HPV positive. She went to colposcopy in July, came back as a scene one. And the recommendation at that time was to co-test a year post-coposcopy. 
So she comes back in July this year, and we get a low-grade HPV positive. Now, previously, in July, you counseled this patient that because of the result of low-grade HPV positive, she needed to be referred out for a colposcopy. So she is on the list for the upcoming colposcopy clinic. Now, today, we discuss the new guidelines with her, and the recommendation now, instead of a colposcopy, is to co-test in a year. So how are you going to counsel this patient? You told her in July that she needs a colposcopy. You call her today and you tell her, no, you don't need a colposcopy. We're going to co-test in one year. So this next slide pretty much summarizes these. And it's very important. Uh, one voice with one message. We want everybody to do things the same way. We want people to counsel patients exactly the same way. So number one, I need you to remember, these are not ADPH guidelines. We are using the ASCCP national guidelines to triage all those patients that have abnormal pap results. And in doing so, we hope to standardize the process. So it is important, first of all, that when you explain to this patient that she does not need to go to colposcopy, tell her why. Don't tell her our protocol says, or Dr. Thomas recommends that we do this. Just tell them, these are national guidelines, we're using these, our doctors should be using these guidelines as well. So even if you take, get care at the health department or get care at the gynecologist, you should be getting exactly the same care and they should be following the same recommendations. And also explain to the patients, you know, these guidelines are research based. They're not something that they just pulled out of a brown bag. It takes years to develop these new guidelines. And Dr. Ha talked about these, you know, all these tables of risk estimates that we have been talking about, they were generated by the Kaiser Permanente after they followed 1.5 million women over a decade. So it does not happen from one year to the next. So it's important that your patients know exactly where these guidelines are coming from. Number two, in doing so, we're using more conservative measures and we're trying to avoid invasive procedures such as colposcopies and LEAP. So remember, we look at the test results, but we also look at the patient history and the threshold risk for these patients. So it's important that you counsel them exactly like this and you tell them this. Now, when you counsel these patients on the results, you need to explain what the result means. When we're talking about a normal versus low grade versus a high grade, you know, I've said this before, and it is important. It's not what you say, but how you say. So in this case, it's how you delivered the message. It is important that you provide accurate information, but that you also speak at a level that the patients can understand exactly what it is that you are telling them. So this particular patient, she had a, a coposcopy. Now she's going to have a co-test in a year. So when you call her, don't just tell this patient, hey, listen, the guidelines change, you don't need a colposcopy, you come back in a year, but if you don't follow up in a year, you may end up with cervical cancer, you may die. So what happens now? You just lost the patient's attention right there. All she's going to be thinking is, I'm going to end up with cancer, I'm going to die. So do I need to come back here? Do I need to go see my doctor? So it is important that you explain this correctly, okay? So... Personally, I explained to the patients on a scale of zero to five, with zero being a negative normal pap, and a five is a highly abnormal pap. So I tell them, if you have an ASCUS at a low grade, that's on the left side of the scale. It's low abnormal cells. Cervical cancer is a type of cancer that takes years to develop. It's not gonna happen from one year to the next. So if you have a patient with a low grade, it's okay to tell her there's some changes, some abnormal cells, it is okay to monitor this for a year, and especially if you have a healthy uh, female with a strong immune system, her body can probably take care of this and regress back to negative on its own. So we are avoiding and right there to have a colposcopy that is probably not needed at this time. So when you document this counseling on a low grader than ASCUS, do not document that you told this patient she can have cervical cancer or she can die because chances are this is not going to happen. However, if you have a high grade, which is on the right side of the spectrum, this is something that, yes, it can turn into cervical cancer. So in this type of patients, it is acceptable for you to tell her 
if you do not come back, you may end up with cervical cancer because you do have highly abnormal cells on your path right now. So make sure that you deliver the message to the best of your ability, but make sure that it is accurate and that the patients understand exactly what it is that you're telling them. So words do matter. Make sure you choose them carefully. Okay, so um, due to time constraints, and we've already taken you over 20 minutes longer uh, than we thought we would, but there was still a lot of information left. Um, if you have any questions when you go through the slides, please reach out to us or um, Beth or Dr. Thomas with any questions. So I think Dr. Thomas has a few words and she'd like to help us close out this presentation. Dr. Thomas? Thank you, Krista. Good morning, all, and um, thank you so very much for your attention. I realize that this has been um, a lot of information, and um, I just want to thank the NPC seniors for doing a wonderful job with a difficult topic. This has been a bear of a topic, and that's why it has um, taken a while to um, present this. But, you know, the one, one good thing about the folks here who work at ADPH is we're good at pivoting and it, many of you have been here long enough to know or remember recall when we added HPV testing and that was was a big fanfare as well so so now we're adding um, we're, we're changing the management of things and and so we, we can pivot to doing this um, my understanding is that there was um, there were some issues this morning in streaming Dr. Ha's presentation, and I apologize for that. You know, he does things in his own um, inimitable way, and and um, this will be available. His presentation will be available tomorrow morning, is my understanding, on demand. So um, I encourage you to um, to view this because it. Um, it sort of sets the framework and foundation for the rest of the, um, for the remainder of the lecture. In the interim, if you've got any questions that um, came to mind as a result of the lecture, please feel free to contact myself or, or Beth Allen with these questions and we'll, happy to sum, we'll be happy to summarize everything and, and return it to, to you. Um, I just want to mention just a few things in, in closing just to um, summarize Dr. Ha's comments again. You know, um, he mentioned two salient um, or important concepts, and that's time and type. So um, matters so that if you have had HPV persisting for a very long time, um, that's going to play into your risk. And the type, we know that here in the U.S., Many of the cervical cancer cases are um, caused by type 16. And even though we don't genotype, we will be genotyping soon and we'll be able to differentiate from the other 14 types that, that we currently test for. So, so just hang on and, and we'll be able to, to, um, to parcel out our patients who are at a higher risk. And we know type 18 is, um, in, is prevalent in adenocarcinomas. So, so again, time, time and type matters. The second concept was based, is, is that these new guidelines are based on risk and not um, results. So it's a patient's risk for SIN3. So SIN3 we know is a surrogate marker for, um, for cervical cancer. So when we see uh, cervical uh, high grade dysplasia, severe dysplasia, we're, we're worried about cervical cancer in those patients. So I wanted to add another concept to that, and that's you know the overarching piece to all of this is that um, we want to provide safer, fewer uh, invasive procedures for our patients, and and lastly, this has to be enduring. You guys know that this has been a field that has evolved over the last several years and continues to do so. You know, we're talking or looking at genotyping, but there's several other um, uh, 
types of testing. You know, Dr. Ha mentioned some of those in his presentation, methylation, and, and um, in addition to genotyping, we see some staining uh, processes that are being done now, P16, KI67. So this is gonna, this is not going to, um, this is not gonna stop. It's going to keep evolving and it's, it's a great thing. So we have to, um, we have to be standard bearers. Just, this is expected, I think this is the level that public health, um, where we should be. We all recall when we had, um, when, when Zika was at the forefront and everyone in the communities looked toward public health um, for leadership. And, and so I think that um, with the presentation of the nurse practitioners showing um, the colposcopy standards as well as um, you know putting it all together, this, these two concepts are important because um, we want to make sure that patients who are served through the health department are treated the same way you and I would be expected if we see our clinicians. So this is of the utmost importance. And also, when we refer patients out like we often do, we want to also ensure that our patients are being um, treated with the best standard of care and the best practice of care. So um, this, this is really, um, really very important. So again, in ending, um, thank you for your attention and please don't hesitate to uh, forward your questions and comments to, um, to myself or to, Chris, or to Beth Allen. Thank you so much. <laughs> this concludes our program for today. I wanna to thank Dr. Huh, Krista, Stephanie, Nasa, and Dewana for being here and thank you for watching. Please remember that you can refer back to the training and resources anytime on demand have a great day.